Our first readers' poems have appeared in Best New Poets, The Believer, The New Yorker, and The New Republic. Her criticism in Quarterly Conversation, Barzak Magazine, and Boston Review, and her fiction in Story Quarterly and Joyland, among other places. Co-founder of Matter, a journal of poetry and political commentary, she's pursuing her PhD in the program for writers at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Please welcome Virginia Conchin. Thank you so much to Bill and Andrew and everyone for hosting. It's a wonderful night and an amazing crowd, and I'm, I'm honored to be here. So thank you, everyone, for, for coming out on this seasonably warm September evening. Um, I am reading a short story called The Perfect Night, um, kind of exploration of willed naivete versus actual hope in a post-romantic age. <laughs> the Perfect Night. I was once irreplaceable on my sister's wedding roster as the maid of honor until our last dress fitting. When did cleavage become a crime, I wondered, while the seamstress smashed my breasts into the bodice of my strapless gown. At that very moment, my sister asked me what I really thought of her Washington lobbyist fiance. I'll show, I said, squirming. Mom thinks so, too. The seamstress desisted immediately. My breasts flopped back out. My sister, in full bridal array, sat down on the floor. Then she stood up and said, put on your street clothes. You are not in my wedding. Alyssa, I said, but by that time I was talking to her back, which was dusted with body glitter. Inappropriate for all occasions other than my sister's ill-fated marriage, my dress was peach satin, hand-sewn, and had cost me an entire week of pay. I unzipped it, put on my street clothes, and left. My sister is an all-star grudge holder, but she doesn't always know what is best for her, which was, with regard to the wedding, me. I'll crash it, I thought on the subway ride home and share my feelings with everyone present. The next week, I received a postcard in the mail that said, not only are you not in my wedding, you are also not my sister until further notice. <laughs> best, best wishes, Alyssa. I started counting down the days. The fact that her wedding was a private ceremony would not present a problem as it was held in the Catholic church, the only free public space left. And while no clergy in their right minds keeps the doors to the house of God propped open for drunk men and women with grimy blankets, it's general, generally tolerated, especially in DC. Alyssa's parish committee had recently convened to address this exact issue. How should a loving, responsible Christian respond to the proliferation of unconscious persons draped on, draped on newly waxed pews reserved for prospering hygienic families? <laughs> she posed that same question to me in our last conversation before the dress fitting, but I hadn't been to church in a year and applied the wrong parable. You have to teach these people to fish, I said, not just lead them to the fishing hole. Something fell off right away. No, I said. Do not throw stones at those people. We all live in glass houses, except for the homeless who live in bushes. So you should invite them into your big glass house and offer them the body of Christ. That parable is about judgment, not charity, she said. She then described how the actual meeting had gone. The vote to institute a zero tolerance policy regarding the homeless was near, un near in unanimity when Pete stood up and said, we were warranty comes in disguise, asking not to be served, but to serve, right? And as a thief at night? I think that scriptural passage should foreground any further discussion on this topic. Pete was booed, she told me. He took two brownies on his way out. <laughs> Did you bring any home, I asked? Homeless people? No, the brownies. Oh, she said, no. Those were the kind of conversations Alyssa and I used to have before my excommunication. Were it not for the fatal dress fitting, we might have saved the world. I was looking forward to the wedding despite having been uninvited. Alyssa spread mad shit about me to our family and friends, though, so I could not call anyone before the wedding to get details on whether my sister was going public with her runaway bride fantasies, which, when we were still sisters, she had described to me in detail. They all involved getaway cars and a top-secret bag of street clothes. It was the wrong epoch for my incarnation. My sister's fiancé was indeed a royal jerk who, before realizing that nepotism was the golden standard in Capitol Hill, had worked, at a car, worked as a car salesman. I had every right to give my opinion, particularly after being asked for it, but doing so had resulted in being axed from the family tree. I was working as a human adding machine at a bank, and I was unhappily married to a mean man named Jorge's. <coughs> the icing on the cake was that I loved Jesus Christ, but he was no longer alive. <laughs> One Sunday last August at church, I took a, lo a long, hard look around. I saw a bunch of money-hungry fakers with diamond cufflinks and two-inch heels. The demeaning, dumbed-down homily had been adapted from the com a comic strip a priest had stumbled across the previous week. Pro football was the subject matter and guiding trope. The ushers couldn't wait to rake in dough for a new marble floor with their long-handled collection baskets. The usher for my pew was virtually twitching. 
While genuflecting after communion, I looked up at the altar. I saw Jesus hanging there on the cross in his loin cloth, on the cross in his loin cloth, head droopy. Mary was to the left, embalmed in plaster, wearing face paint. She looked like a drag queen. I don't remember what happened after that, but I was taken from the church to a hospital and sedated, which didn't really bother me, except for the fact that I had no memory of what happened. I called my church friend from the lobby. Before telling me never to call her again, she told me I had walked down the aisle, stood at the lectern and said, hey, you fakers, I like the opening hymns and the part where we pray for other people in unison, but the rest of the shebang is a joke. How did people respond, I asked. They were mad, she said. I think I'm falling in love, I said, with myself. I haven't been back to church since, with the exception of a special prayer session I'd seen advertised in the church bulletin, which I only received because the church secretary hadn't updated the mailing list yet that year. I envisioned a laying out of hands for people who really needed some extra help in a sterilized carpeted room. It was irresistible. I went up to church the following Sunday at 5 p.m. and sat down in front of two ladies in their 60s with gray beehives who asked me to tell them the greatest problems that were weighing on my heart. Spill it, they said. Don't hold back. I am in so much pain, I said. I hurt everywhere, all the time. I started weeping, but I knew from experience that I tended to lose people that way, so I told them I didn't like my job and that my dog had a tumor on her foreleg that needed to be removed. Fuck my job, I said in reference to my job. I want to do the right thing, but the operation will bury me alive, I said in reference to my dog. I had been trying to explain myself along these terms my entire life, but no one understood. Are you married, they asked tenderly. My husband is not worth mentioning, I said. They nodded. I think they understood, too, that I was just talking about my job and my dog because the real problem was inchoate and huge. I was so fucking grateful that I relinquished all attempts to be a high self-monitor and started praying out loud the kind of prayers I prayed at home on my knees. I want to light a candle, not curse the darkness, but the matches are soggy and no one has a lighter, I wept. I just want to praise someone, but the world is full of fakers who kick their dogs, and the wax keeps melting on my fingers, and it hurts so bad. Those ladies got on board right away. It was like reading someone an avant-garde poem, and instead of getting a polite response about how vivid the imagery was in stanza three, they just respond by reciting a poem of their own. Lift your head, they ordered me. Hold your head up high. I did, but my face was covered in snot. They handed me a box of tissues and proceeded to lecture the Lord on my behalf. Lord, they said sternly, this young woman is suffering. She is a lost sheep torn on the brambles of your fallen world, and she is reaching out for you in the darkness. You have failed your disciple, they said, and need to dispense with a miracle like now. <laughs> I stood up. Then I fainted. I came to on a cot with those same ladies hovering over me. It worked, I said, sitting up. I feel a lot better. I had a transpersonal moment then, the kind that happens in adolescence when you become able or willing to imaginally enter into the experience of other people for as long as you can stand it. I saw myself reflected in their eyes. I was wretched. Fuck, I said. Young lady, they said, although in truth it was probably only one of them speaking and the other nodding in agreement, an aggregate of empathy. You are the Lord's beloved, and you are beautiful in his eyes. Really? I said. I feel pretty pathetic. We are an Easter people, they said. We keep our eyes fixed on the Lord. Me too, I said. I really love the Lord. Then I started crying again and made a request for lemonade, which was denied only because I didn't have any. <laughs> I do not like living in a secular world. Most publishers only accept agnostic drivel from their former college roommates to whom they owe a favor for having previously published their agnostic drivel. My book, like manuscript of religious essays, has no commercial value and probably not be purchased, let alone appreciated in any context, ecclesiastic or worse. I tried to read in one to my husband. After telling me Hallmark was hiring, he smacked my face. This brings me full circle to the reason I decided to crash my sister's wedding during a weekend trip to Tijuana the previous July. She confided in me that domestic violence was meted out in their relationship like clockwork. She said there was a rhythm to random bludgeonings. Like bebop, I said? That had been my experience. No, she said, Zeppelin. That night while she was in the hot tub, I read her diary, which she still kept at 31, though referring to it, like most of her peers on Wall Street, as a day planner. <laughs> I'm afraid the next fight might result in major reconstructive surgery, said the previous day's entry. I put the diary away and joined her in the hot tub with a drink. The big day came up fast. I didn't bother dressing up and snuck into the back of the church right as she was walking down the aisle holding onto my father's elbow, just as the priest was asking, if anyone does not wish to sanctify the union between Patrick and Alyssa, speak now or forever hold your peace. Run, Alyssa, I shouted, run! Then I booked it fast and hopped on the next subway. <laughs> I was familiar with Alyssa's plight. Patrick reminded me of Jorge's with style. Shortly after our honeymoon, Jorge to find the terms of our marriage. He was free to beat me by whatever means he chose, but the gag in my mouth would be adjusted periodically so that our neighbors were in earshot of my pleas, variations on, oh my god, not again. On my 26th birthday last year, Jorge's got skunk drunk. I was sad, but hopeful. Will you take me out to dinner, I asked. 
No response. Take me out to dinner, please, I said. He changed stations on the TV. Hunger! Me! You! I screamed. I was determined to take matters into my own hands this year, and so after two subway transfers on the way home from the crashed wedding, I stopped off to pick up party favors and invitations at It's Your Party. A party I figured would be a good opportunity to reconcile with Alyssa, plus avoid physical injuries for a night. I plan on telling Jorge that my party was women only, then inviting my male coworkers. If Jorge crashed it, I would have him throw it out. That night I told Jorge flat out what I'd done. He damaged me. I was so far gone that I'd come to crave Americana, the kitsch of lazy Saturday beatings, and the surreptitious visits to the drugstore for 10 pound bags of ice. My mental health had become tenuous, and I didn't want Alyssa to go down this road. I can't speak to the other experiences of women who cling to abusers, but I'm sure, pretty sure it has to do with a lack of cash. Jorge fails to meet even most of the most basic job expectations for a decent husband. For starters, he calls me Amy a lot, even though my name is Aaron. A vow is a vow, that is why I am still married. And Jorge's is still nice some days, especially after his third beer. The ratio of what is given to what is received in the last five years has become increasingly lopsided. I give him my heart, mind, body, and soul. He tells me he likes my collarbone. Though I no longer attend church, there's a lot of talk in my Bible study group right now about taking the good with the bad with regard to one's spouse. Amen, I said. No one's perfect. Amen. Until very recently, it has not occurred to me that my husband is mean. My worldview for the last five years was that I had a terrific, imperfect spouse. My mother told me my spouse may not love me the way I want to be loved, but he loves me the best way he knows how. Amen, I said. I am starting to have my doubts. The day after the wedding, Jorge and I went shopping for a new couch. I sat on the first couch I saw, brown vinyl, and said, I am not leaving the store without this couch. I was talking to myself as Jorge was already at the other end of the store looking at leather couches we could not afford. After 10 minutes, a salesman came by. Do you have layaway, I said? Yes, he said. Then he looked closer. Ma'am, are you crying? I'm a Christian, I said. I want this couch. These are hard times. He sat down next to me. Together we recited the 23rd Psalm. Unfortunately, Jorge has eyes in the back of his head. Our prayer session was interrupted right between I will lead with you beside the still waters and I will restore with your soul. Jorge did not address the salesman directly, but his nonverbal communication said, get away from my woman or I will fuck you up. On the ride home, I was despondent. When we got home, I threw things. I hate window shopping, I said. I wanted to buy that couch, take it home, and sit on it. I have an idea that will set your mind and my mind at ease, he said. I thought you said we had one mind and two bodies, I said. We do. This will set our Siamese mind at ease. Here's the plan. Every time you have an erotic dream involving another man, I want you to report back to me in the morning. I won't judge you or get mad. I just want to know. That sounds kind of weird, I said. And you know I'm susceptible to auto-suggestion. What if I start having dreams about other men just because you put the idea in our head? Deal, he said. I shrugged. <laughs> that night, I dropped I had sex with the salesman on the vinyl couch. The next morning, over OJ and waffles, I told Jorge just as he was getting ready to move the lawn. It was my idea, I confess. I approached him. Did you like it, he said. Was it good? Before I could answer, I saw his gaze travel to a discarded bike chain draped across a room in a chair in our bedroom from a bike I had tried to repair myself. A paroxysm of desire crossed his face. He might have been jealous of my non-existent dream lover. I really don't know, but it went downhill from there. Almost done. <laughs> Happy ending, I promise. <laughs> a week later, Jorge and I were in the living room after dinner, sitting on our corduroy couch side by side. Our legs were not touching. I can't stop thinking about that couch I wanted. I said, did you see it? It was brown vinyl. You will, said Jorge. Can you give me the remote? I handed him the remote. Then I went for a walk, and I didn't stop walking until I reached the state line. I hitched home, hitched hike home two days later, narrowly, narrowly averting disaster. Jorge was livid. At least he notices me, I thought, after being thrown against the wall. A week after my attempted escape, I received an omen from the real Lord. My faith in the Lord is ebbing, it is at low tide. I know this because my singular prayer has become, I refuse to worship a standoffish Lord. I am worried because I am no longer sure who I am praying to. Who else lives above the cloud cover if not the Lord? The omen came from one of my Sunday school students, a five-year-old girl named Leah. I was helping her stencil the resurrected Lord onto a piece of paper. I was thinking, yellow. There's gotta be some yellow once she gets to the coloring stage. I had turned into a bird brain. Miss Erin, Leah asked me after I handed her an unsolicited yellow marker, what's that bump on your cheek doing? Why is there blue on your face under your eye? She wasn't sympathetic or even inordinately curious. She just wanted to know what was up with the topography of my face. <laughs> there was no point in lying or in telling the truth. Blessed are the pure in heart, I said, for they shall see the Lord. The next morning I called Jorge's out of his shit. I don't like it when you hit me, I said. Who died and made you God? Amy, he said, the greatest light seeks the darkest shadow. I am the shadow, and I am in your life as a gift so that you can learn to accept your supernatural radiance. My 27th birthday arrived right on schedule. I was enjoying myself <laughs> thoroughly, and my guests were happy to the point of stupefaction. 
At 9 p.m., the phone rang. It was Alyssa. I forgive you, she said. I don't care about that, I said. Did you marry him? No, she said. After you left, Mom got violently ill. The next day, I had time to think, and I realized you were right, but I wasn't ready to see it, the dress wing. I know how you feel, I said. Jorge came home at 10 o'clock and stood in the door with a keg. I need a bouncer, I said. Ian walked over. Don't hurt him, I said. Just get him off the premises. On the wall above my bed is a clipped out magazine interview with Bon Jovi. After a lengthy interview about his latest album, he was asked to describe the perfect night. A quiet evening at home with my wife, he said. That's all. Thank you. Mm -hmm.